Thank you very much. And thank you particularly for inviting me to present on this platform this afternoon. I'm just going to share my screen. So today I'm going to be talking about the application of mathematical modeling to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, mathematical modeling is one of those fields that was really brought to the forefront in the media and among uh, scientific researchers um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Though we mathematicians had been busy with disease modeling for the last hundred years or so. So in terms of our poll that was just presented, this is certainly one of the good things that have come out from the pandemic, personally for mathematical modelers, but also in general for, for public health. So today I'd like to present on behalf of the South African COVID-19 Modeling Consortium. And this modeling consortium has been formed by the National Department of Health and coordinated by the National Institute for Communicable Diseases. And the purpose of this consortium really was to provide mathematical modeling support to national government during this COVID-19 uh, epidemic in South Africa. And so I make this presentation on behalf of my colleagues, uh, Professor Juliette Pulliam, Dr. Gazina Mayorath, Dr. Brooke Nichols, Lisa Jamieson, and Dr. Harry Moultrie from the Modeling Consortium. And I'm going to be talking today on one of the primary outcomes and topics of our communication as a modeling consortium. And that's really on the uncertainty of outcomes and what it takes to develop not just a disease model for COVID, but an evidence-based disease model. And so it really is an overview of the process that we have followed and the challenges that we have faced throughout, uh, throughout uh, the, the last year. So we'll talk a little bit first on what mathematical modeling really is and how it can be useful. And then we'll look at the South African experience from the, from the modeling consortium perspective. And we'll finally end off with some lessons learned and, and quite importantly, what can we do to prepare for future epidemics? So when we think about mathematical disease modeling or maths, anything, it's easy to, to have this picture in mind. We imagine equations, a hand-drawn diagrams, writing up on a chalkboard, but actually mathematical modeling, it is still equations and, uh, and path diagrams and so forth, but it is also so much more. Um, and it has become so much more with the development of technology. When you harness te this technology and when you take your mathematical models and focus on applying them to a real world situation, practical models, we have to bring in considerable amounts of data. And so what I'm showing here on the left hand side is um, an NICD dashboard on data at award level for COVID-19. At the same time as bringing in the data, we know that not all data is readily available in numerical format or has even been collected. We as mathematicians in developing our models are not virologists, we're not economists, we're not public health specialists and biologists, entomologists and so forth. And so we have to have a lot of meetings with those clinical experts and domain experts in order to help us properly understand the disease we work in, the population being affected by the disease and the public health system in which this disease is manifesting or being managed through. And so we have a lot of meetings um, in order to discuss the data and areas where data is not available. And finally, we take all of our equations that we saw in the last slide, we couple it with the data, contextual and numerical data that we have, and we write it up as a set of computer code. And what we then do is use, um, this, uh, use our computer programs to make our projections and to, to gain insight on the behavior of, of disease and what the trajectory of the epidemic would be like. So that really is mathematical modeling. If we want a definition of modeling, mathematical models are tools that create synthetic populations or make-believe populations in silico, so on a computer, 
And these synthetic or make-believe populations, virtual populations, have features or characteristics that are very similar to the real world populations we want to emulate. And when we have this virtual population, this computer-based population, where the disease is manifesting, we can then measure out the impact on options for disease control or elimination to get rid of a disease in order to see what would be useful and what would be less useful. And that really is what mathematical modeling is all about. It's about using our maths, combining it with disease knowledge and computer programming to create a tool to support better decision making. Now, how can it be useful in an epidemic uh, sense or in the middle of the start of an epidemic? Well, we can use our disease models as we have in the South African situation to project the future trends of, uh, of, um, the, of the disease or the infection, to project how severe the infection might be, what might the mortality arising from a disease be. We can then also use our tool, our model to predict the impact of interventions. Should we be uh, using, uh, should we be relying on self-isolation versus external quarantine? What is the impact of mask wearing? Um, what is the additional lives saved by uh, installing or installing field hospitals or expanding our hospital capacity? We can also use our disease models to estimate the cost of and the resources that are required to manage an epidemic. We know that right at the beginning, we were wondering about how much a people PPE would we need? Would we have enough hospital beds? Did we have enough staff to manage those hospital beds? If we were to expand to manage what the severity of the epidemic would look like, what would the cost be there? Or where would that money come from? These are questions that government was interested in, that National Treasury was interested in, the provinces as well, but also business South Africa and the public at large. And another important feature of disease models is that we can use them to better understand the disease, to explore the relationships between disease characteristics or features of infection. So these are all many ways in which disease modeling can be useful at the start of an epidemic, during an epidemic, and also retrospectively after an epidemic to take um, a, a reconnaissance or to take, a, to take stock of what actually happened compared to what was projected. And so what I'm focusing on right now is, the, is how to develop an evidence-based model. So there are different ways, there are different philosophies of disease modeling. Some disease modelers focus on expanding the theory of disease modeling and the mathematical properties of models. Other models focus on supporting decision making by making your models as practically relevant as possible. And the brand of modeling that we subscribe to is on the practical on the practical edge to support decision making, but very importantly, focuses on being based on evidence, on being based on data. And I'm going to present what we have done uh, briefly um, in the modeling consortium in the context of the three waves. The first two, which we have experienced, the second wave being almost at its end, and then perhaps a forthcoming third wave and what we're doing from a mathematical modeling perspective to prepare for a third wave. So let's focus on wave one. Wave one started in March last year, as we know, and peaked around July, August, and we saw the decline of the wave towards the end of September, October. And it was different to the different provinces. So in order to build a disease model, we were requested to build a disease model at the start of the epidemic. And we had, we had to make a decision as to what kind of disease model we wanted, what questions was it trying to answer, um, and this would determine the methodology that we used. The key questions at the time were, will we have enough resources at hospital level? How much is it going to cost? And how bad is this epidemic really going to get? Those were the questions we were seeking to answer. And the methodology that we chose to employ was compartmental disease modeling based on ordinary differential equations uh, rather than an agent-based approach because at that time, we, there was not much known about COVID-19 at all. There was no local data. In fact, there wasn't much global data because COVID-19 was new throughout the world. 
And so in developing this model, we tried to, to get as many data sources um, uh, into the model as, as possible. We looked at, as the data was being collected, we incorporated the national case data and the hospitalization data from the NICD. We knew that we were facing considerable challenges because the hospital data did not have all the hospitals in the public sector reporting on it. In fact, it is only around about now that we have, in the last month or two, that we have all uh, public sector hospitals reporting on the database. And so we knew that there was missing data. Nevertheless, local data was better than no data, and so we incorporated that into our model. We incorporated data from Stats SA on the likely population projections for 2020. We knew that if we, if we were building a model for the whole country, we would need to know how people were moving um, bet between spaces in, in the country, that people from one district could move to another district and, the, and either get infected or spread infection. During the initial lockdown levels when movement was prohibited, this wasn't an issue. But as soon as we reached level two and level three uh, of restrictions, movement was widespread. And so we, we formed a relationship with Vodacom, a mobile provider, in order to access their data on the number of mobile events that occurred in one ward or one district, but were also registered in other districts and wards in the same day. And this helped us to understand how much people were really moving around the country and where they were moving to. We also corroborated some of the mobility data from, uh, from Google mobility reports that have been a free resource um, to, to, to the world populations. When it came to deaths, we were able to access the death registers from the National Department of Health, but we also corroborated our, our data with the SAMRC excess mortality analysis, which looked at those deaths that were perhaps occurring due to COVID outside hospital, or rather looking at those deaths that, would, or that were in excess of what would have been the case in the last two years had COVID-19 not occurred. And this was all the local data that we were able to harness, but there was considerable biological information that we just did not know from a local context. And so we had to look to the global experience where we uh, consulted published and preprint academic uh, literature to assess biological characteristics of COVID-19, such as incubation periods, relative infectiousness, the proportion of asymptomatic infections, and so forth. And sometimes we knew that the international literature just was not relevant to South Africa, but we had no South African data. And so what could we do then? This is where the beauty of collaborative research came up, where we, through the South African COVID-19 modeling consortium, were able to um, garner the expertise of groups of experts, intensivists and clinical experts and virologists, economists, public health experts, those in government and so forth. And these experts together were able to advise us on certain parameters and data sources that we would have required in order to robustly build our models. And so we developed our models, not just one iteration, but about four or five iterations during the first wave of COVID-19 projecting initially for a short period, but then also projecting over the course of the epidemic and updating it as new data arose. And as we, um, what our uh, primary findings of this initial wave of modeling were, we, 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 we took into account the population behavior um, that we had some information on and used that to extrapolate as to the severity of the infection, how much in, uh, the COVID-19 would spread and its result in severity. And we were able to support government decision-making by providing scenarios on the need for resources along with the anticipated use um, uh, of, uh, of resources, as well as projections on, on deaths, um, both in hospital and out of hospital. And these findings were communicated widely throughout the decision-making partners uh, within and outside government. So for example, we had uh, reported our projections to the Ministerial Advisory Committee, the MAC. Uh, we also supported hospital planning with respect to the planning of beds, 
the number of staff required at each month during the course of the uh, epidemic, the quantity of drugs that were required to be stocked in hospital so as not to overstock or, or perhaps more importantly understock um, drugs that would be uh, required in both ICU and the general ward. We also assisted with oxygen and ventilation planning to um, help with the supply um, and availability of, of oxygen, as well as the determining where the field hospitals would need to be opened, uh, opened or, or, or developed. We supported the National Health Laboratory Service as well as environmental health with the number and placement of mortuary containers um, throughout, the, throughout the country's hospitals and private sector as well. And we supported National Treasury with the health budget. But the very important thing to note is that when we were communicating the outcomes of our mathematical models, we never, we never um, communicated it or we attempted as best as possible not to communicate uh, our projections as a, a crystal ball type of prediction, because graphs like this are very alluring to, to believe that this is what is going to happen. And that is not what mathematical modeling is about. Mathematical modeling is about what if scenarios, that if we make certain assumptions based on data that is available, this is the likely outcome. And so we did our best in our, in our communications to highlight the uncertainty on how COVID was so novel, there is in fact so much unknown, um, and how we didn't always have local data. And in particularly for COVID compared to other diseases, because there's no treatment or cure, so to speak, just management of, uh, of, of symptoms, a lot of the spread relies on the population's acceptance and adherence to non-pharmaceutical interventions. And how a population behaves, well, that is, uh, that is not something that is easily numerically measured. And we did not have data to, to allow us to understand what the proportion of mask wearing was versus social distancing and hand washing and so forth. So at the end of the first wave, um, we, like many others, had thought, OK, perhaps we're in for a break now. The rest of the world seemed to have had at least a couple of months break before a second, a second wave started. Perhaps South Africa will be equally lucky and maybe more so going into summer. And so we were as well struck by surprise when we started uh, seeing an increase of cases in the Eastern Cape and wondering, what could this be? Why are we seeing cases increasing so soon after the decline of the first wave? And so what we started doing then was instead of rushing along to, to, to recalibrate our models and build a, build a new model, we started asking the question, why? Why are we seeing this increase in cases? Is it because of people moving? Is there increased mobility? Is it because um, of previously un of previous areas that, were, that, were, that did not have a lot of infection in the first wave were suddenly now getting, getting infected? Um, is there a biological change in the, um, in the behavior of the disease? Could it perhaps be loss of immunity? We started asking all of these questions and speaking to experts and interrogating what data was available. And it, it was very difficult that we could not find one, uh, you know, one uh, single reason as to why we were seeing this resurgence. And so while we were getting requests for, can you please provide new projections on your model? We took the decision at this point to not model. It was quite a brave decision, I think, where we, we said, actually, I'm sorry, we are not going to model and make projections right now because we cannot be sure of why the resurgence is happening. And so our mechanistic models need a reason for a resurgence to happen and, and not just a, a, a random occurrence and the, uh, from what we, were, what we were seeing in the Eastern Cape cases rising quickly. And it was a good thing that we waited as well, because it was only a, a few weeks later that the knowledge of a new variant um, that would be, be behaving differently um, came about, became well, became well known. And even so, with the new variant, there was very little information as to what it would mean from a disease perspective. Is it more severe? Is it more infectious? Um, is there protection, a cross protection from those already infected in wave one? Without all of this information, we felt as a modeling consortium that it was just not responsible to build out our typical predictive dynamic models. But that doesn't mean that we couldn't be supportive to decision makers and government in other ways. 
And so we used our analytical expertise to monitor resurgence. And so we developed what you may well um, which you may be well acquainted with already, the dashboard, the SACMC Epidemic Explorer.co.za. If you haven't visited this dashboard, please go have a look. And you, um, it's a it's a wealth of information on tracking uh, signals uh, to to monitor resurgence across the country. And that's exactly what we did. We pulled our analytical brains to come up with a set of indicators to track different features. Of, of a resurgence, uh, when a resurgence first starts versus when it is um, increasing increasing rapidly. And we use this to support government who had a resurgence plan where ca the categories of action were, were, were grouped into what we have here as a control phase, an alert phase, and a response phase, where each of these phases corresponded to a different set of actions. And so we programmed this in along with our series of, uh, of indicators and supported decision making to determine the um, when resurgences would start in different areas around, around the country and what the appropriate course of action would be. And so in developing this um, resurgence monitoring framework, we also, along with government, made this short term sort of forecasting or signal forecasting available to the public. And that is the dashboard um, a URL here that you that you see up here. And so we also used our time to prepare for when we would be able to start modeling again. And that means collating new data, working with different partners in the, NI in the NICD, in private sector, and in government to find uh, new sources of information, the different seroprevalence studies that are ongoing, for example, the different studies on reinfection um, and uh, on com the impact of comorbidities in the public sector and the private sector, collating all of this new data so that we could be prepared for when we were able to start modeling, modeling again, doing our mainstream kind of modeling. And so as we see now with the second wave being well on its decline, many provinces, in fact, six out of nine provinces, if you visit our dashboard, have crossed the threshold for being out of the second wave. So Africa as a country has also crossed the threshold for being at the end of the, uh, of the second wave, though cases are still around, but quite on the decline. So as the um, epidemic now is on the decline, we start thinking uh, and looking forward into the third wave. What are we going to do now? The first wave, we worried about resources. In the second wave, we chose not to model because there was a little information on the new variant. What's, what are the key characteristics of the third wave, if a third wave even comes about? Well, it's going to be about variants and vaccines, taking into account what we now know about the variants and coupling that with the vaccine vaccines that are being rolled out and have differential impact on our variants. And so this is a, this is currently work in progress. Um, and we are we have developed or are developing a modeling framework that takes into account this new lineage with the um, with the variants. It takes into account reinfection through immune escape from the old uh, from the original wild type uh, COVID-19 to the new variant right now, and taking into account the vaccines that are being rolled out to the uh, different priority populations in the phases um, planned by government. And in developing this framework, local data is imperative. We now have a lot more local data than we had six months ago, even two months ago. We are now able to take into account the many seroprevalence studies that have been conducted. We take into account the hospital outcomes analysis to look at the risk of mortality and the risk of admission between those of different age groups, those with comorbidities and those without, and so forth. We can take into account what we have learned from the various vaccine trials that have been in the, in the media. There have also been several surveys on the population's response to NPI use, the ability to, to be wearing masks and to hand wash um, and socially distance and how that has changed over time in line with the restrictions um, and the changing of restrictions from government. And we are also using the mobility data that we have collected already. 
And this is now going to serve us to answer some questions on what might some of the characteristics of a third wave be. We know that variants and mutations arise randomly, so we may not be able to tell you when a third, third wave will arise, but we can explore a variety of scenarios as to the different ways, the different manifestations of the third wave. And this can help planning um, so that hospitals, um, in terms of drug quantities and staff and bed availability, are able to plan and prepare and be ready to cope with, uh, with another wave of COVID-19. And so if we focus on the lessons learned during this uh, entire process of modeling, we've learned that local data is not always available. And if it is not available, assumptions need to be made. Local context is often much better than, uh, than just referring to what is globally, uh, globally available. And that is where we have significant local expertise in South Africa in order to fill some of the gaps where numeric data is not available. Uncertainty in our disease models must be highlighted. These are not crystal balls. These are not 100% accurate. There are times when our models are very inaccurate. And so where our models are strong, we should speak about that. But where our models are also limited, we, it is even more important to highlight that. Public communication is also a full-time and an ongoing effort. We've recently in the modeling consortium uh, set up a Twitter account and we have a website and as well with our dashboards where we are trying to be better at public communication than we were in the first wave of COVID-19. Adaptive modeling uh, or rather modeling to support decision making means that we have to be able to adapt. We have to be able to change our models quickly. And so our models can't be too cumbersome or take weeks to run when decisions are needed in days. And so we need to be able to adapt our modeling. And in order to do so robustly, we need to maintain our continued interaction with decision makers and partners, users of the models. We should know where our models are not appropriate or not responsible to use. But importantly, we should always remember that disease modeling or mathematical modeling is not just for mathematicians. It is a multidisciplinary field. We need to involve the clinical experts and the biologists and the economists and the public health experts, computer programmers, and, and so forth. It really is a truly multidisciplinary field. And there's something in it for, for everyone to be part of a disease modeling team. And so if we're looking forward beyond 2020 and trying to stay ahead of the curve, what should we be busy with right now as, as disease modelers? Well, we're trying to anticipate the various forms in which a third wave may arise, looking at the possible triggers and their associated outcomes. We are trying to support the rollout of vaccines by being part of the uh, Ministerial Advisory Committee for Vaccines, trying to establish priority groups for vaccines and to optimize the distribution, um, the timing and the impact of our vaccine rollout, knowing how precious and limited vaccines are. At the same time, we need to maintain the monitoring efforts for resurgence because this is the first step to know when a third wave is going to arise. We've got to keep watching those case numbers, watching the um, hospitalizations and, and so forth to find these signals to be ready. But if we're thinking just beyond 2020, not just 2021, but into the longer term, modeling capacity is limited in the world, not just in South Africa. We are lucky in South Africa to have um, at least three uh, uh, large and, um, uh, and uh, pr practically involved modeling groups. And so we, there is already a lot of uh, uh, senior modeling capacity in South Africa, but we need to develop capacity over time. We need to train uh, young, young South Africans who are interested in mathematics and computer science and biology in this field of disease modeling so that there will be um, a cohort of modelers in the future. To start off, there are two modeling courses that I can, um, that, that might be um, attractive to, to those interested in the field. Um, Masha, my unit at University of Cape Town offers a modeling, a modeling course, which you can access at the link below. Sasima at the University of Stellenbosch also offers a similar modeling course. And so you would be, you'd get a very good introduction to disease modeling by attending either one of these courses. 
And so just to end off that, I would like to, to thank the um, hosts of today's, uh, today's program, but also my colleagues at the South African COVID-19 Modeling Consortium, uh, Professor Juliet Pulliam, Dr. Gazina Mayorath, Dr. Brooke Nichols, Lisa Jameson, and Dr. Harry Maltry from the NICD. We are a good example of three institutions from three separate universities coming together to work seamlessly and with a lot of dedication to support disease modeling in South Africa uh, for COVID-19. And if you have a, if you would like any more information or have any questions on disease modeling or the work of the modeling consortium, do contact us at the email uh, address listed below. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.